Hi. Well, welcome everyone to the Silver Solutions webinar. And this is actually the season finale of the Silver Solutions webinar. And we are, we are very happy and proud to present Kosana Suwacharov today, who's going to be speaking about biometeorology and our work with irrigation and greenhouse gases. Um, we are going to be continuing this webinar series, but actually it's going to get adopted by the new leaders of the water program team. Is, it, is that correct, Sam? Do you want to? Yeah, yeah. I, do, I don't want to elaborate about this. So, um, uh, so the, yeah, the, the webinar series, it seems that it will continue uh, in the next year. They will figure out the roster and so on. Also, I think uh, the name may change. Uh, so don't don't get too super attached, but uh, uh, this is going to be season finale, and also uh, it's going to be the this is one of the iterations of many for sure to come. Uh, yeah, but yeah and super. I think it was a great success. Like I think we've all um, you know learned a lot from each other, and then all of the the web previous webinars are posted. So you know if you know somebody who wanted to join us today but couldn't make it, uh, it'll be it'll be posted on the site. So we're recording it for that reason. And, and also, also something to mention here is um, super super excited to have a uh, Cosana. Uh, uh, the person that is uh, closing this uh, webinar series. I think Cosana was scheduled for two or three months ago, but anyway, in between the pandemic and a lot of stuff, uh, uh, we move it and this is super excited. I think uh, uh, we have generated very good uh, community through the webinar series. And I think also, um, if I remember correct, uh, Cosana, you've been here for about what? A year, a year and a half? A year and a half already. So a year and a half. Yeah, I know, but look at uh, the community and, and the, uh, the people that are coming here. So without further ado, let's start. Let me see if I know to share the screen when I don't have double screen. That works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can see your screen. Awesome. So I was thinking, what would my be if somebody asked me for silver solutions in California water, and I'm new to California, so my first um, uh, question would be, what could I measure? I'm the most comfortable with micrometeorological measurements, although I like to measure things all the time. And then I have most experience in evapotranspiration measurements. And um, Recently, I was also able to get some um, experience in greenhouse gas emissions measurements. And I hope that silver solutions would be based off of these measurements for adaptive measures in agriculture to both manage the water and uh, try to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions either through directly through the management or by running the irrigation pumps less and have some sequestration potential in the in the crops. So in my past research, it, it was always uh, something to measure to see how different uh, management practices will impact the water use. In this case, uh, in Spanish nectarines, we had a different mulching compared to no mulching. And uh, this was actually subflow measurements. I don't know if you can see a little spots here with the, with the wrapping. And uh, then also these uh, netting structures about table grapes were used together with mulching to decrease the water use. So it was almost only transpiration water use in these cases. And also that same netting reduces the evaporative demand of the atmosphere. So we had a mini weather station underneath the netting to see how the conditions also change. And then I was uh, lucky to get exposed to greenhouse gas emissions and methane measurements in rice fields in uh, Arkansas, working with Ben Runkel and his um, great team of people. We had this alternate wetting and drying comparison between um, traditional uh, flooded rice and, and uh, other fields that were had intermittent flooding and that was managed in a way to decrease the methane emissions and our 
uh, multiple years of measurements showed that there was a potential for 65% or more of methane redu reductions when only few floods were. Um, a few times the flood was interrupted during the uh, growing cycle of rice. And then I, I was also uh, always uh, trying to see how surface renewal can be useful as a more affordable method for evapotranspiration measurements and differently from um, well-known um, eddy covariance method that uh, requires sonic anemometry to quantify how much the exchange between landscape and biosphere happens based on, on the vertical wind measurements and the um, high frequency of scalars. Uh, in surface renewal, we observe these ramp-like structures uh, here as the area was is exchanged between the uh, atmosphere and the biosphere and um, these uh, sweeps and injection happen all the time and they're driven by coherent structures and the more wind there is the more turbulence there is we have better mixing and we want to see how from these ramps we can also estimate flux and how this can be beneficial versus uh, traditional eddy covariance and if surface renewal was used for um, for only evapotranspiration measurements, we can rely on, on uh, less complex equipment and for less skilled users. It's more affordable, it requires minimal maintenance, and it therefore uh, allows us to have a higher measurement and spatial coverage. It is also applicable in roughness and uh, inertial sublayer, and therefore um, applicable on smaller scale. The idea is to look for um, for these ramps and their slopes in, in high frequency signals and to, um, we see them if we simultaneously plot like here CO2 water vapor and temperature signal we see them simultaneously and um, we can uh, estimate the flux from these ramp slopes and the biggest challenge with surface renewal was always the calibration factor, which was initially 0 0.5. But recent approaches suggest that uh, these um, calibration factors can be uh, computed as another variable based on measurements. And they can be, uh, or in the case of uh, Shapland um, method, uh, it can be avoided by using just thermocouple and uh, distinguishing the bigger ramp scales from the smaller that are intermittent. And they can, you can use several of these cheap sensors to, to enhance the measurements. And I was very attracted to uh, surface renewal similarity based approach because we had measurements of CO2, water vapor, methane, uh, temperature in our rice fields. I wanted to see how we can estimate these uh, calibration coefficients for each flux separately and calibrate for every half an hour to get a, um, very good results for both daytime and night nighttime because Shaplan method is mostly for irrigation purposes and is working um, mostly for unstable daytime conditions. And then uh, we, we published uh, recently this paper where we compared for um, sensible latent heat flux and uh, CO2, we got very good results when we use a sonic anemometer to, to uh, have measured directly uh, turbulent uh, um, parameters we need for calibration. But once we wanted to skip the sonic anemometer and use just horizontal mean wind speed, the results here are um, in shaded are the results from the plots from previous where we had direct measurements and the these uh, lighter uh, stripes are for the for the results when sonic anemometry was skipped so we have some more uncertainty in the results if we don't use uh, sonic anemometer but still pretty good agreement and then uh, i thought we can take advantage of this in california and instead of using this pricey uh, measurement setups, we can replace uh, sonic anemometer and infrared gas analyzer just by a thermocouple and cup anemometer so that we can have a lot of uh, 
fields uh, measured. There are 300 crops in California or more, and uh, a lot of need for measurements. I've seen that in this year, and uh, we can't afford always the equipment that is necessary for direct measurements. So if we are interested in daily values, which I'm often asked from the commodity boards when I work with them, then we can even skip the soil part of the sensors and get the daily evapotranspiration values. And we call, the, call these surface renewal light towers when they don't have sonic chronometer. And thanks to this um, method where, where um, more affordable equipment can be used, we have installed more than 30 towers in Central Valley. Uh, some are not even marked that they installed with uh, collaborators in last month. Here, but uh, I, I think 30 plus towers we installed uh, over the year I'm here in cherries, pistachios, almonds, citrus, celery, cover crops, winter wheat, and alfalfa, alpha, and probably I'm forgetting something. So this is a uh, celery towers from uh, Ventura County. They are near uh, Los Angeles for those that are uh, not familiar. Um, we have a full uh, tower where sonic is present and we have light tower where the only two thermocouples are deployed and this is because there were two different varieties one is for fresh use and one is for um, for processing celery so they have a different canopy growth and and their evapotranspiration will be different and then we have a cherry uh, orchards we installed uh, Hours on this painter scaffolding, and we. This is uh, Rick Snyder here, still being very active. And this is our student Mary Rose and visiting student Gaet. So in the first year we installed a CSAT, and um, then this year we realized to, um, to gain more height, to be above the canopy, uh, and still be safe on that tower walking. Uh, we can gain more height with the RM Young sensor. So this is this year's, a few months ago, installed sensor and thermocouple, maybe not very visible here. And then we had, we plan to measure <laughs> California cherry ET, but we found that uh, the farmer collaborator wanted us to measure three orchards that have different density of the trees. Yeah, had, also the trees are different age because newer orchards are mostly grown in a higher density system. And uh, he wanted to see how we can gain with this higher density more crop drop. And uh, therefore we tried to measure three different orchards simultaneously how ET is similar or different. And we had uh, uh, next to Edicquarian's tower, we had um, uh, measurements of applied water, stem water potential to see how the plant is stressed or not stressed. And uh, we also has, uh, had the light bar passage with this awesome machine by Bruce Lampin and group. And the initial results are coming soon. We had very one year measurements with the very wet year, one very dry year this year. Uh, it's still ongoing and we will do the third year. And um, so far I can tell you that if one was to use crop coefficients from FAO 56 tabulated um, values, it would, uh, it would probably be 10 to 20% over irrigating. But uh, in, I'm, thinking of all three that we measured so far, so even the high density one. And also by measuring stem water potential, if we pay attention to this threshold value that is uh, in black, all orchard almost all on every day, it was high above that value. And there seemed to be a lot of room to, to decrease the water use, not only as a deficit irrigation, I think this threshold value is for not even to reach a mild stress in prunes. So there is a, there is a room to, to, to do this research with somebody interested in deficit irrigation in cherries, especially for their um, harvest is in, in early in June and there is a whole summer and fall of irrigation needs. And also with the, this project, we were able to add one more 
Simi Station to California Network, and this, this is number 262 for those that are near Stockton, Linden, that need a better, uh, closer tower to, for their weather data. And recently, we also got a project with Julia leading a project and working with um, Dr. Z uh, to see how to estimate the chilling requirements of uh, California cherry, and not only based on meteorological measurements, but also to, uh, to have continuous meteorological measurements, but to occasionally sample the plant and take to the lab for uh, carbohydrate dynamics analysis to see if we can get a better insight if we combine these two uh, together to see when the bud break can be expected. And then we also use the chance that we had these structures in cherry orchards to uh, install five array of five sonic anemometers for Mary Rose uh, master thesis. There is Mary Rose uh, seeing if they're aligned together on the orchard floor. And uh, we measured the turbulence within the canopy and got some interesting results there too. Then uh, recently in collaboration with uh, PhD student Bill Rice and um, Thomas Hart and Laura Fogle, um, we collaborated to install one tower in strawberry daughter plants in Butte Valleys north from here. I think we'll set 300 miles north from here. And um, these uh, strawberry plants will be transplanted somewhere else, but uh, they're very dominant crop, as I understand, in that area. And for somebody that is concerned about groundwater resources, this is a um, important measurement to have of how much these plants use water. And then this was a very exciting project and it's still ongoing um, for cover crops in rotation with rice. And the, the idea here is that uh, rice farmers are very more and more often deciding to transfer their water rights and then they grow cover crops over the winter. And uh, these cover crops are perfect trap for for nesting birds and their eggs very often get destroyed with the tr traditional practice of disking cover crops in, in late spring when precipitation is expected to stop. So we are studying here evapotranspiration of full cycle of those crops to give time for nesting birds to hatch and have, um, have better habitats. And, uh, yeah, we didn't know how much these cover crops would use water and, and uh, we chose a winter wheat. This is Janae Chattapaus and my student in, in a fallow field in the winter time when it was muddy. This is fallow field in the spring when it dried and cracked. And then we have here vetch and next to this field we have a mix of vetch and, um, and uh, oats and beans. And we measured how, how much difference we can see in ET, which crop would be a good shelter for nesting birds and which, um, which would use uh, water the most, because some of those can be also beneficial for the soils. And we were seeing a lot of birds in, in the winter and found the eggs on two occasions in May and June. And this is more or less how the system was um, was planned to have uh, cover crops and fallow. This is maybe not a fair scheme because each of these systems exist in each of cover crops. And we measured the um, soil water storage and, um, and the water uh, table. We measured the evapotranspiration and also rain input. So our initial results show that fallow field used as much water as it gained through precipitation although we didn't have the chance to measure for the full season or the cycle of power crops because the farm management changed their plants and they planted safflower in mid-May. So we already had um, some uh, machinery entered and uh, disrupt this, this crust and, and, and 
um, You cut out for about 30 seconds. I did get a message that my internet is unstable and I came to the office for this not to happen. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now well? Yeah, yeah, we can see you well. I think let's, let's start over from this uh, slide. Is it from the slide or results? Yeah, no, only for, yeah, for, yeah, let's start there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our initial results show that uh, fallow fields used as much water as it gained through precipitation. And uh, unfortunately, uh, farm plants changed. So uh, this um, soil conditions were interrupted by machinery entering and uh, preparing the land for safflower planting. And then safflowers started growing and using water and sunflower is famous for having very deep roots and consuming a lot of water. So it wasn't strictly fallow field for full cycle, um, cover crop cycle for us to have a um, nice comparison. But fortunately, we got uh, funding for another year to study this again next year. We are planning to try to be clear about what we need from the, from the farm management to maintain the fields. Then winter wheat was the one that used the most water. And um, maybe in this case, we, winter wheat can also be harvested. And I know that in, in our farm, it was harvested for the grain. So it can get some income from the grain by using more water. And the vetch and vetch mix had the less water use. However, if we, if we think that uh, these cover crops used water throughout the winter when there was some precipitation. It results that only one sixth of what rice water requirements would be for that season was used by vetch and cover crop mix. So we, we think that this is a very small portion of, and there is a, still a, a lot of water left for the farmer to transfer or since it's a, such a small portion, maybe um, some incentives can be um, can be um, in place for farmers to to uh, for the water they are using for these cover crops, and we still haven't seen the the we haven't processed well the the soil data we have here. Emma digging in a spring for the soil view sensor and then Jeanne happily un uninstalling it in in the fall and. Um, we actually have here nine depths of measurements, except these, measure, these sensors didn't work as well as we wanted them because of the clay soils and it's such a elastic soil that changes shape and cracks. And so we will have to think about something to increase the measurement resolution soils next year too. But we do geoprobe um, sampling several times per season. So we will have some dynamics of soil water storage here. And then using the chance for wheat fields, uh, a, wheat, a huge wheat field that we had here close by in Davis. So, um, we collaborated with Andre Bakash and he, uh, he was flying drone about the wheat fields when exactly when Lancet 8 passage is happening. And um, he used the Sable model to estimate evapotranspiration from drone and Lancet 8. And then we used our eddy covariance sensible heat flux that was directly measured to estimate ET from surface energy balance. And that was our reference method. And uh, initial results, he, we have one day of uh, comparison when the results were pretty good. And uh, we can see that uh, eddy covariance, uh, uh, that uh, drone ET was 3% different from eddy covariance and the uh, Lancet ET was 5% different. So this was something interesting and now Malika and her student Logan are continuing to do uh, flights in cherry orchards to see if we also can compare. And I know Logan was recently measuring every two days, maybe even today, he met, he's flying very frequently and trying to match the satellite passages, but also what's happening in between. And I think he'll soon do every two hours in the day to see what's happening within 
one day. And then since the high density olive uh, orchards are becoming very, um, very widespread in California, uh, and there is uh, not much published on uh, crop coefficients and uh, evapotranspiration of these systems in California. I, I will be lucky to continue work of my late PhD advisor, Antonio martinez Cobb to uh, measure the evapotranspiration of these systems in California. He did it in northeastern Spain. And he showed in his publication that this is evergreen crop, but the crop coefficient curve is not flat when, as it is now uh, used in California. So he actually uh, showed and motivated us to do this in, um, in California and update the water use information for mature, well irrigated, high yielding, um, super high density olive orchard in California. And then maybe based on this full irrigation measurements to develop deficit irrigation protocols and also to use remote sensing and plant-based um, information to move toward automization, automatization of precise and efficient water management in olives. And this is a huge collaboration. We have plant physiologists, water management uh, people, um, uh, olive quality people, Selena Wong, will have the, our samples of the little olive uh, fruit taken to her lab to analyze for um, quality of, of olive oil and potential to improve the quality by um, applying deficit irrigation in, in some uh, parts of the season when it's critical to do so and interrupt the vegetative, vegetative growth while maintaining the fruit growth. Yeah, so this will be very interesting also study and I'm looking forward to stall it. Then also we wonder how much um, can an orchard as uh, perennial systems with different degree of pruning and uh, cover crops in between the rows, how much they can sequester um, carbon and are they actually carbon sinks or sources? And with uh, Malika, Isai and Chata Paul, we wrote a grant and are waiting to hear if this will be funded to install uh, several towers with infrared gas analyzer and simultaneously uh, monitor water use and annual carbon balance and see how is it uh, turning out. If, we, if you pay attention here, we have March, with a lot of grass between the roads. We have a July with a lot of grass between the roads and leaves and the trees. And then we have January with very rich grass between the roads. So how do th these trees and grass work together to sequester carbon these um, orchards? And the most recent tower <clears throat> was installed in a poplar grove that was established at UC Davis. Uh, land and we uh, want to use these poplar trees as a second generation biomass crops and in collabora collaboration with Peter Freer Smith and Gail Taylor and Chata Pau who all had some degree of experience with uh, second generation biomass crops. They had a similar study in UK in the past with Willow so we want to uh, deploy, and we did, and uh, direct eddy covariance measurements to quantify carbon water dynamics of this system on an annual basis. And then to also try, they, they have a new um, grow established also for drought treatment to see can these um, crops be uh, grown on marginal lands or with less water and used also to offset uh, fossil fuel use. So that, that will be interesting to see too. We just installed this tower two weeks ago, I think, and the, these trees are growing very much. And then in the future, I hope to keep evaluating Further, the affordable methods for micrometeorological measurements, or add some measurements that will be uh, that will be affordable to evaluate the Casta land surface model of very different landscapes, and see if uh, we can power uh, 
and have some regional studies based on, on this uh, uh, model's capacity to cover much larger area than my measurements would ever be able. To. And then if we can is expand work on cover crops and uh, what are their benefits also with the um, winter precipitation use versus um, something that would use water when, when it's uh, necessary for other crops. And then I might start working on winter safflower and sugar beet on their farms. We submitted two or three grants with um, Steven Kafka to measure their water use and um, couple that with modeling uh, with the uh, fertilizer needs. And I hope to start measurements of methane nitrous oxide in addition to evapotranspiration CO2 soon. I have a sensor in mind to, to purchase and start, but um, this is still something uh, for the future. And that's it for me. I do have more time to do more work than this, and uh, I hope you have many interesting questions. That was great, Kosina. Thank you. I mean, I, I think we'll see what kind of questions people have, but that was a really wonderful overview of your work. Um, so at this point, I think we'll, we'll see if any of our participants have questions like this. You know, we hope that this is a, a conversation and please feel free to ask mm -hmm. Kosina a question. Um, if you want to use the hand raising function on Zoom, we can moderate that way. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Ben. <laughs> I can't find my, raise my hand. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, deficit irrigation, you know, something like in cherry could be really important for, you know, the valley when we're not getting enough chill. And you can really induce a stress that will cause earlier flowering. And I've, 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 I haven't done it in cherry, but I've done it in peaches, where you can actually uh, stress the, the a tree in J July and August and bang, it flowers in September. And I wonder if you could, you know, play around with that to get earlier flowering in cherry. And two, whether you could reintroduce the Verdelli effect, which is used in citrus, because the, the lemon market is dependent on, um, the prices are, are better in the summertime. And if you can induce the flowering in the, in the late summer through water stress, um, you can get that that summer crop. So, you know, it's one of these balancing things where, you know, you got to stress it just right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I Are you uh, thinking about having a double crop in cherries by flowering in fall? <laughs> well, it, it would be, you know, they're always playing with earliness. And uh, I would think of um yeah, because there wouldn't be enough time to get enough chill hours later on. But I mean, if they could harvest crop in February, you know, you know, if you could induce stress in August 15th to 30th or something like that, and that would cause the flowering to occur, um, you know, it, it's something to play around with. Interesting. We actually do plan to install uh, one of the, these <laughs> measurements and uh, sampling um, orchards in uh, North Valley and some uh, around Bakersfield too. So we'll have two different uh, yeah. zones of cherry growth. Well, the problem with North Valley is it gets too much rain and you start getting blight and stuff like that. But in the Kern County area, you know, what, they get seven inches of rain or something, it'd be yeah. much less problem. Yeah, actually two years I studied this uh, orchard that we didn't have a good harvest because of the late rain that uh, yeah. broke the skin of the crop mm -hmm. both times. It looks like they're, a, they're, they're gamblers. They, I'm sure they'd, they'd go for it if they could get an earlier crop. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Mm -hmm. It looks like Ben Runkle has a question. Go ahead, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So just so everyone knows, I found the hand button under participants. So you, that's <laughs> the, kind of a surprising place to discover that. Uh, thanks, because on a really great uh, range of field sites and 
questions to ask. There's lots, I'm sure it's endless. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you've encountered with um, getting good estimates or ideas about good estimates in these heterogeneous canopies. So the, especially like the places where you have trees and rows and um, how you're dealing with some of those questions. Yeah, so you would expect that covariance to pick up a whole system together and it's pretty like when you watch from the top it's so flat and nice because they top those crops but um, for example I do get um, flow meter data to match better where the, the trees are more dense and there is a less grass between the rows then if I have a micro sprinkler that uh, irrigates whole area between the rows and the grass is much richer and there's a more distance between the trees so I have more contribution of grass ET there and I have less matching um, ET to applied water with what we read from flow meters. And you anticipate almost fully that all of the water that's going on there is being evaporated. That's what you mean by matching. Yeah, I, I would uh, love to see that, but uh, <laughs> the is, the, also the, this orchard where I don't see matching uh, is, I think, 50 plus years old. They might have very potent root systems that reaches much uh, deeper into soil. So that might be a thing. I'm, I'm Still not sure what's happening there. And Absolutely. we still need to see uh, somebody to see the uh, uniformity of irrigation distribution. So yeah, it's more challenging than a wonderful rice fields in Arkansas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe combining all the soil water balance and um, energy balance. And uh, you know, there's a number of ways to try to constrain. Thank you, Ben. Any other questions? Sam and I always have questions. Oh, yeah, I, was, uh, yeah I, I do have, so I mean, keep in mind. Yeah. <laughs> not here. Hey, Cosana, something that uh, super nice that you're interested in uh, cover crops. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I was thinking about cover crops is, um, so uh, you mentioned that uh, the relationship of the cover crop evapotranspiration in relationship to wheat, winter wheat. So winter wheat is the cash crop in mm -hmm. some places there. Or, or is it, what, I, what I'm trying to kind of relate is that, so they have two options, going into a cash crop, which it will be wheat harvested and then get some money or going into cover crops. And then, I mean, get all the benefits of uh, soil and, uh, perhaps infiltrating a little bit more and then going, is that, is that accurate? So because uh, we need them to keep the wheat in place until uh, mid-July, it turns out it will be harvested for grain. It won't be okay. harvested uh, in spring to be for biomass, but it will be harvested for the grain. It, uh, I heard that it's not very profitable to grow wheat. Maybe you're not surprised. <laughs> and then recently, the, there was incentive for farmers to leave longer their crop in the field because uh, harvesting might, might um, hurt the little birds that didn't have time still to, to exit the fields. So they have some incentives uh, to leave the crop even longer. And it turns out that it's not harmful for the grain, but uh, the farmer runs some risk of uh, maybe fire or there are some risks that farmers run, but they can get substantial um, income from hosting the birds. Okay, so it is, it is kind of on, on that side of not growing wheat, but uh keeping it for good uh, bird habitat. That's, that's, that's super good. You were saying that it is about a sixth of the uh, rice evapotranspiration, the cover crop. For, uh, for um, vetch and, and uh, cover crop mixes, mm -hmm. for, um, for wheat, it would be maybe one, one fifth of the water. Okay. <laughs> so 
a little mm -hmm. different. Uh, yeah, it uses a little bit more, but um, it takes advantage nicely of the winter precipitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know or I saw that Alisa was on the room also. And when, I, I think I saw her too. Yeah, when we were uh, doing some of the analysis for winter cover crop in, I think, in almonds and tomatoes, mm -hmm. uh, it was, I think, the difference, I might be wrong, it might be a, an inch or half of, of an inch in the difference between bare soil and the, mm -hmm. the difference on the EP. And, and so basically, we were thinking it was just one irrigation. The uh -huh. main difference of having a cover crop or leave it as a bare soil, for the growing season, it will be one extra irrigation. It is, uh, that is kind of the cost of the water cost of cover crop, which I don't think is that bad. When you're saying also one six, I was trying to kind of figure it out. Uh, on just balancing the benefits. Um. Yes, and this was very dry year. I, I thought if there was uh, more precipitation in spring, the cover crops would grow lo uh, much, uh, much more uniformly and longer into the summer. However, I was corrected yesterday in the meeting by our colleagues saying that uh, high precipitation in, in the winter might uh, give more patchiness in that power crop and I can get much less growth. So he said that this was actually good, but I, I, I have just one year experience so far. <laughs> How do they kill the cover crop? Do you know? Um, there was some uh, very stubborn weed growing because these were, uh, these were uh, organic rice fields, Lundberg farm. And um, they just asked us to pull our equipment out because the car crop was dry, but that weed was so um, stubborn that they flooded the fields. They, okay. They're organic farms, they don't know. Uh... Yeah, because I, I think that one, no, I, I was asking you this because I, again, I think the main, so what I'm, what I'm uh, hearing from you is that it may or may not be a, an economical reason, and they may even get more just by uh, providing some uh, bird habitat. Uh, so I think I think that's good. One, uh, I was asking you about how they kill the cover crop, because in some of our uh, the ones in our study for tomatoes, if you didn't kill it at the right time, it will affect uh, when you're going to plant and it will affect when you're gonna sell the production. And, and that was one of the riskiest factors or the thing that it was to make it or break it economically. Sure. Yeah, but, it, but in here, it seems that you just kind of pull the, uh, the machinery, kill it, and then if there is any weeds in there, you're just gonna flood them. Yes, I, again, I don't have enough experience, but um, if you think that the rest of the season they will uh, transfer their water rice, they won't be growing anything until next spring when the rice okay. uh, will be planted. So they won't affect their rice production in the year mm -hmm. they decide to do water transfers. It's mostly beneficial for the soil to have that cover crop to prevent the mm -hmm. water or eolian erosion and mm -hmm. to maybe have some soil health benefits too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no definitely. Hey, thanks. Are there any other questions for Kosina? Alisa, you unmuted yourself. Oh, I. Yeah, any other questions? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I also couldn't find my hand thing. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if this. This isn't really about what you presented, but I wanted if you could talk about more of the project that um, Malika, you guys, both of you um, submitted to talk about, or the grant that you wrote, I guess, to talk about quantifying both greenhouse gas emissions and water and grass and trees all together. That sounds really interesting and um, hard <laughs> to do. <laughs> yes. So, 
I was mainly motivated by this grass between the rows that grows whole year. So we don't have really period of the year that's not green in those orchards. Uh, so I want, and I was really surprised to see them knee high to grow in the winter time when I visited to maintain this array of five sonics. So that was my motivation. And then knowing that um, um, almonds are growing like mini forests with the very little pruning and uh, that maybe apricots don't have enough uh, information also on how much um, water they, they need. I thought maybe also including apricots to see if they are uh, sinks or sources of carbon and see how this uh, land use change from annual to perennial crops can be beneficial for sequestering and storing that um, carbon into the plant tissue and root tissue and especially with the new research that um, um, almond growers are interested in recycling whole orchards and uh, chopping and putting back the, the whole tree back to the ground. I thought it would make sense. And then Malika was interested also to uh, study this and her student Logan is super excited this, uh, on, about these measurements and to fly drones and see how much uh, uniformity we see across those fields. And we thought it would be nice um, but we are um, waiting to hear about uh, this funding, if we will be able to do it. Cool, thank you. I might follow up and email you guys a little bit more, but thank you for your presentation. It was really great to hear everything you're doing. It's sure. so much fun. It's awesome. Thank you. So I recognize that the hand raising function is hard to find. So if, if so, anyone has a question but cannot find the hand raising function, just feel free to unmute and ask. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, so Kosana, I just, I just feel very, very impressed with just the volume <laughs> and the number of towers. Like I wrote um, Sumachara of Net and I, I kind of feel that way. Like I, I, I'm curious, just what is it like with data management and, and how are you going to like make all these data available for folks? Are they available somewhere? Um, like what, it just the scope of this, I, for folks outside of California, I mean, I, there, there are whole entire states where you're lucky if you see one or two of these towers up and just how many you <laughs> are working on is kind of wild to me. Uh, so I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about your data management, where, you know, people who are the, 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 the modelers who are, you know, salivating <laughs> at these data <laughs> could maybe go to find, find some of them. <laughs> yeah, so the main idea is to have a lot of um, measurements to hand it to modelers and remote sensing folks to cover bigger area and see how representative those measurements are of other fields. So I would really be happy to hand this data to someone that, that want to use it further. But um, I was also thinking about inviting Emery Flux uh, to visit the site. I don't know how they would feel about saying that many towers come and visit, but my colleague that asked me to install 20 of those, he, he found a way of managing data uh, with Land IQ, Daniele. So I think I, I'm not so overwhelmed yet, but uh, I keep getting requests on a, sometimes on a weekly basis to install a new tower in a new crop. Sometimes it's on a monthly basis. So the network is growing and I would like to upload that data to Emory Flux network, except they, I have to talk to them if it's attractive enough, if it doesn't have ET measured directly. See. So is the yeah. are the data already available on Land IQ, or is it is that kind of the game plan? I'm not sure about that. I I'm not managing that data. I'm managing uh, other and plus towers. So and there uh, the ones I manage are not available anywhere online. But you have to write me an email. Yes. Okay. That was kind of the big question. So for now, for we now. write you an email, but maybe in the future, yes. um, 
there may be some, yeah, I would think it would be very attractive to them just because it, there's so much of it. But I see what you're saying about is, you know, is the surface renewal method going to be enough for them? Kind of right, a or even anti covariance if it's only sensible heat flux, but um, it might be, I, I definitely have to talk to Emory Flux folks to see, and they sometimes have equipment that they can, um, um, land you to add to landscapes they're very interested in. And yeah, there is not a big representation of Emory Flux towers in Ag in California, which is also understandable. We deploy them for only a few years to derive the crop coefficient and we, then we move them elsewhere. Whereas they need maybe something more permanent to observe over years and yeah, but that's definitely the future plan. Wonderful. Other questions? So many people here. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Sam, is that you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that is me, but it sounds we can like... Keep, we can keep going, too, but I do want to give folks an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think mean, it was someone trying to... You have some that. burning flux questions. Now's your time. Now's the moment. Yeah, burning flux tower question. <laughs> no, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not burning. <laughs> Has, I have, I have just like a fun question. Um, what's, like actually Lo Logan was asking me this. What, what is the tallest flux tower that's ever been installed? Do you have any idea? Cause I was just thinking of like the redwoods cause you could really work in any system, right? So like, do you ever think about putting a really tall one out somewhere or do you, what's the tallest one you've ever heard of? Uh, can I respond? What's the tallest one I've been on? <laughs> you can respond however you want. <laughs> Even that, I'm not sure. In in Louisiana, Ben and I visited Joy Deep. Uh, that was fantastic view about the um, um, forest. What was that forest type? It has a specific name that is flooded. Yeah, a bottomland hardwood forest, and I don't remember the height, but it was very tall. It was a lot of climbing. Yeah. Yeah. Really pretty sunset. <laughs> it looks like uh, Cameron has a question. Cameron, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you felt that if different soil management techniques, uh, specifically in perennial cropping systems, would have an effect on the overall ET rate for that land area. And if there is, how would we capture that as it seems to be a lot of these techniques are being promoted and incorporated into these crops. Yeah, well, I feel they do. I haven't measured yet, so I'm not sure. <laughs> there is a, there is this problem that crop coefficients are normally developed for well-drained soils. So we have different soils, and within one field, there is a lot of heterogeneity. And um, yeah, I feel that uh, measurements are representative of whole system. So they will give you uh, an idea of whole one orchard, but that orchard can have different soil than another orchard that might be nearby. So definitely uh, water retention um, uh, capacity of the soil will have an impact. Kosna, didn't you do some work kind of like that in Spain with mulch? Didn't you measure? I feel like I've heard you talk about some previous work related to mulch management. Is that yeah. yeah, but mulch was mainly to prevent evaporation from the soil surface that will be wetted with these uh, drip lines, but it wasn't really adjusted to the certain soil. So I guess to follow up, um... I mean, I would assume mulching would kind of reduce the soil evaporative rate. So that means the overall ET for that area would probably be affected as well. 
So yeah. I don't know. I don't know if coefficients have really been developed for that. Like, I mean, conceptually, yeah. Like, you know, water is not lost as much in the from the soil, but like overall, what's going on? Yes, and with the with drip irrigation, the soil evaporation is so so little already. It's maybe ten percent or less. So it's already highly reduced. I don't know if it pays off to have mulching and dealing with residual of mulching to decrease that much of ET. So I'm not sure. It, we also, when we measured, we realized some of these mulches also block the precipitation. When it rarely happens, it blocks it from reaching the soils and taking advantage of this precipitation. So I, didn't, I haven't published this work because we didn't find a lot of significant results. Oh, so um, just a comment on that tallest canopy. It depends what you mean the tallest towers or the tallest canopies. The tallest towers were the boundary layer towers, of course, the tall towers that are hundreds of meters tall that are averaging entire boundary layer landscapes. And the tallest canopy, at least in the Meriflux, used to be, probably still is the, um, the Wind River canopy crane for that site that Davis, that we ran for 10 years and then was taken over and now Neon has taken it over and reinstalled their own equipment there. Um, but that's around 65 meters tall. It's not as tall as the giant sequoias, but it's pretty tall with Douglas fir and Weston hemlock. Um, and that the measurements are at 70 meters, which are lower than the boundary layer towers, of course, the tall towers. I think you might have seen them, Malik, or, or know about the tall towers. So those are, of course, the tallest towers, but the tallest ecosystems are probably things like Wind River, at least in the Meriflux. Okay. Thank you, Jetta. That's wonderful trivia <laughs> to know. Not, I guess not trivia, just facts. <laughs> it's not trivial. Wasn't that the daily double? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think maybe we've got time for one more question or comment. We always try to end at five o'clock just to be respectful of everyone's time. Anything else? Last not burning flux tower question. <laughs> <laughs> and I see that Kosana has put up her, her Twitter information as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I would definitely, he, she, she does post some pretty cool pictures from the field. Like I, I got mm -hmm. so excited when you posted the picture of those eggs. <laughs> mm -hmm. So follow her for, for fun pictures. From, from the daily life of a biometeorologist. <laughs> hey, Kosana, something that I, that, so my last burning question. I, when you were saying, when you were talking about the uh, uh, cherry, cherry trees, so there was, so the values that you were recording were not as negative pressure as the ones that you have that line. So I remember seeing a lot of dots and then the line, the black line below. So the black line was the um, a, a leaf water potential pressure for being for the trees to be stressed. That it's a recommendation how to oh, keep see. the stress or mulch stress in the mm -hmm. in the prunes. Okay. By Ken Shackles lab. So. Yeah, the cherries were always about, I couldn't find a day in the week, whatever day in the week I go, I cannot find that they're stressed. Occasionally one day would have, but mostly for some outliers, it's not really. So, and they were actually not that close to that tree, so, to that line, sorry. So what, what you were saying is that it might be, there might be a way there to, to not irrigate as much. Yes, there is pl plenty of room to, to decrease irrigation and still keep the crop non-stressed. Okay. Um, so I think we're almost there, but Daniele, I saw that you unmute yourself. Uh, comment, question? No, I, I had a question related to the, to the uh, cherry. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, the cherry orchard, is, uh, I mean, those are in the Delta, so there might be some uh, um, 
some sobbing of water um, that somehow contribute to um, keep this uh, tree on stress and transpiring so um, highly. So my question was, uh, is related to the yield. Have, have you guys measured uh, the, the yield of this uh, orchard? Just to get a sense of whether this, uh, this tree perform according to the county average or above the county average or something. I mean, trying to understand whether the, uh, the extra water used with respect to that threshold of stress, no stress is somehow beneficial. Yeah, so did you say they're in Delta? They're not, they're near Stockton. They, so they're not in Delta, but they can definitely reach with their roots probably, or I shouldn't say definitely, they should, they could probably reach some deeper soil uh, water storage, but um, uh, the harvest this year was again impacted by the rain in May and in June. There was very few days of precipitation that have again broke the skin of the crop. And um, I talked to a farmer, they measure yield per each block of each of the orchards. They, he said the year was very poor and the shelf life is poor. So he was very unhappy with the yield. So I hope that we have uh, some representative yield next year, which will be our third year of measurements. And then uh, I recently learned that uh, also cherries can have uh, alternate bearing. So sometimes the denser orchard might have a less crop harvested than the less dense orchard. And it's very difficult with fresh fruit yield, but that would be the most interesting question to see if we can really express the water use uh, versus crop yield. Well, what you're talking about is probably related to the quality of the yield of this year because uh, when when rain happens, the you know the, the cherry cracks and it start mm -hmm. you know degrading and so uh, maybe get a sense of the quant the quant quantitative part of the yield is also uh, interesting to see uh, whether you know they produce more than 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 other location in California. And you would do it even if the skin was broken and they have a lot of loss of yield? Well, I don't know. They, I think they harvest all the cherries. They don't leave the cherries on the tree. And so they, you know, they weigh, uh, I, I don't know how they, they, they do the, the yield measurement in, in cherries, but, you know, getting, getting a sense, even in the historical, the historical average yield over the course of the last five years or 10 years of those orchards just to, to get a sense of the baseline. Sure. Well, the, um, the grower seemed to have a very good record of his yield. So I didn't measure myself. I think he will hand me all the information. Okay. Thanks, Daniele. So I think we're, we're there. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Tosan, and thanks, uh, Malika. This, this was definitely a um, wonderful uh, webinar season. And then good that actually is finishing with Tosana. Uh, 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 anything else to, to add? No, no, not at all. Thank you so much, Kosana. And then, uh, um, you know, to all the attendees today, we are going to take a little break um, of these monthly webinars, but just, you know, stay tuned to either mm -hmm. Twitter and also the, the Water Program Team Collaborative Tools group uh, on ANR, and we'll be posting when the next ones start up again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you everyone. everyone for coming. Everybody have a good evening.